All right, so Dave, we are jumping into another Metaverse project out there. You guys know it as Star Atlas. I think you're gonna love this interview. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back to Tech Bath. The gaming industry, when it comes to blockchain, has really exploded. There's a handful of companies that are starting to kind of come to the top and really are making waves. And one of them is a company and a project called Star Atlas. Joining me today is Michael Wagner, their CEO. So great to have you on the show. Hey, Paul. Great to be here. Thank you. Excellent. So you're coming to us live from Las Vegas. I love that That's part right. anyway, because there's not many blockchain companies that are in Las Vegas. So I, I love the fact that it, this has kind of become a global community. I'm talking to people in Beijing one minute and in you know Sydney the next and Dubai the next. And now we've got, it's good to have a home, a home crowd here on the show. So... <laughs> Yeah, I mean, Las Vegas is a it's a city that never sleeps, and uh, building this company has proven that that's a necessity. So, uh, Big time. Uh, but love Vegas, great city. But yeah, uh, fantastic to be joining you. So, Michael, in in the organization se- itself, talk to us a little about kind of the first the genesis of Star Atlas. What were you guys trying to do? And then, how did you go about the process of launching the team, the devs? really kind of the evolution of where Star Atlas is today. Sure. Um, I, I would really take you back uh, quite a few years now, going back to 2013 is where I got my start in uh, cryptocurrency and Bitcoin through uh, script coin mining with GPUs. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I come from a background in traditional finance. I'm a CFA charter holder, worked in portfolio management, investment in securities analysis. And identified pretty early on that these, you know, cryptocurrencies, digital assets could be an alternative asset class. In fact, I was pushing pretty hard back in those years to uh, get things like Bitcoin included in client portfolios. But um, clearly the industry was still in a, in a very uh, uh, infant stage. And so right. a lot of skepticism around the potential of it. But um uh, you know, I got in, in in 2013, script coin mining, really poor timing on my own behalf. It was right at the peak of uh, a bull market cycle at that time. And, um, uh, you know, this immediately preceded the collapse of Mt. Gox. And so from a business standpoint, creating these GPU rigs to mine coins uh, wasn't very lucrative. But fortunately for me, it did captivate my interest in the potential of the technology and the potential of the industry. And so I spent the next couple of years just um, doing as much research and analysis as I could about uh, what was possible with this new realm of tech. And so in 2015, went full time into cryptocurrency, gave up my formal career, launched my first company in 2016. And through that process of launching that company, I ended up recruiting uh, two guys by the name of Danny Floyd and Jacob Floyd. Now, these are two team members that went on to co-found Star Atlas with me. And so we were operating this other company I own. It's it's called Tokes. It's at the intersection of crypto and cannabis, providing decentralized financial infrastructure for the legal cannabis industry. Um, but we were experience a bit, uh, experiencing a bit of a lull. So um, in mid-2020, uh, we were still kind of in the depths of a uh, uh, secular bear cycle, I guess I would say, in cryptocurrencies. And um, we had identified what was emerging through not only NFTs and predominantly collectible NFTs, not utility driven NFTs at the time, uh, but also this emergence of DeFi, so decentralized finance, as well as the very nascent stages of blockchain gaming. And uh, Danny, Jacob and I all have a deep background in gaming. Uh, Danny in particular has uh, an enormous amount of experience in AAA game development. And so uh, mid-2020, we conceptualized Star Atlas, and the core concept was we can build a AAA quality game, the, the highest caliber and quality gaming experience, and um, enhance that through financial incentives and mechanisms only available through blockchain and through decentralized networks. So incorporating things like NFTs for true asset ownership, Uh, crypto native assets that enable uh, decentralized governance as well as a form of play to earn. And then, you know, looking forward at other decentralized finance primitives that we could introduce to the game to further enhance our uh, user bases earning potential. Okay. So a a lot to unwrap there. I mean, the fact that, you know, one, your lineage in, in the space itself, I think has a lot to speak for kind of the evolution of where and what we're seeing in the gaming community right now. Were you surprised, obviously you were kind of an early adopter, but were you surprised at the amount of growth that we've seen in the sector right now? And the number of, I mean, if I was looking at a VC roster just yesterday, 
that absolutely blew me away in terms of the total number of VCs active in the, not only the gaming, but in the metaverse space itself, which can encompass a lot of different project layers. But were, are you surprised at the growth in such a short time? I, from a timing perspective, yes. Um, we, we saw the metaverse space and blockchain gaming space as being very promising in the first place. Um, you know, I've made relatively bold statements in the past that, that blockchain gaming and metaverse is going to lead to one of the largest mass migrations of users into the cryptocurrency space. Um, it's one of the you know, preeminent, uh, maybe not first, but preeminent applications uh, within blockchain that uh, has true utility, value, and potential to attra attract users for experiences that exist beyond things like pure speculation and trading of assets, and really um, kind of the reimagination of traditional finance instruments inside blockchain. So, um, not surprised that that at the growth, um, this has been an absolutely blockbuster year, though, and we're seeing just an enormous amount of innovation going on around blockchain gaming in general, and also, you know, major companies like Facebook rebranding and pivoting themselves right. to meta. So uh, pretty, pretty right. amazing. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, we've seen just the uptake on uh, just metaverse in general, much less the amount of game companies that are really coming to market. And, and also just in general, the, the whole idea of blockchain gaming and kind of the evolution of what that means to play to earn and play and earn. Uh, one thought, and, I, and this I ask a lot of some of the CEOs we cover here, on, at least on the gaming sector, when you see this, because you know I've lived through the era of the dot bomb era, where we saw a massive run up of startups, and then the VC community that kind of followed along with that. It has a lot of similarities, eerily, to that era. Do you think, Michael, that we have maybe too much froth in the space right now? And do you think we'll see some major correction, at least in a lot of these projects that maybe never really get off the ground? Kind of your thoughts on that. Well, I, I don't know if I would say too much froth. I still think we're at the earliest stages of um, the emergence of this uh, kind of concept. And so, um, sure, there's a lot of projects that are presenting um, their project proposals and opportunities. Uh, right. Many of them will fail, just like in every other you know, startup environment. Many of these yep. will not succeed, and many of them are kind of over-promising or, or associating themselves with the technology in a way that um, might, might not be entirely genuine. But uh, So those projects, sure, they're, they, they likely will not succeed in the long term. But um, I don't think we're at a phase right now where we're in euphoria, where it's overly frothy. Yeah. And I, I think we're just starting to see the, the beginnings of this. That's good to hear. I'm, I'm glad to hear that because sometimes I'm too close to the bubble. I feel like, you know, because we see so many projects coming in and the analysis that we're looking at, the number of, of uh, CEOs and dev leads that we talk to, it, you know, you start to get that overheated feeling. So it's good to hear that from you, someone who's as seasoned and experienced in this space. Michael, let's get into the gameplay. Let's talk a little about really what kind of separates Star Atlas from what we've seen in early stage game development, at least in blockchain. What is it about Star Atlas that you guys are trying to do that really kind of separates you from the pack? Sure. So Star Atlas as a video game concept is a grand strategy space exploration MMO or massively multiplayer online game. Um, what really separates us was our choice to use um, the game development engine that we're building in, which is Unreal Engine 5. Mm -hmm. And so comparing us to um, maybe the existing gaming uh, projects, not only across, uh, well, well, predominantly across blockchain, but you know, we're looking at uh, hyper-realistic, fully immerse immersive cinematic worlds. Um, I see we have uh, the trailer on screen here. And yep. um, yeah, the, the, the idea here is that we can build worlds that are almost indiscernible from reality and, and bring our players into the metaverse and into Star Atlas as a game and have them feel like they are truly living in this space. Um, and what's, uh, you know, secondarily differentiates us from a lot of these other um, projects is that we've put an enormous amount of thought into the underlying economic design, both from a token economic standpoint a gameplay uh, economic standpoint, but also a real world economic standpoint. And, you know, um, once again, uh, kind of contrasting the way that we've developed our economy from uh, existing games is that our ambition is to build a product that can genuinely live in perpetuity. And we can get in and discuss a little bit of, around, you know, how decentralization and decentralized governance with the Star Atlas DAO will enable that. But metaverse concept 
at large is a platform right, that enables content creators, innovators, and entrepreneurs to build and generate value for themselves. Um, uh, you know, gaming, so Star Atlas as a game is the first application that will live within the Star Atlas metaverse. Um, but our ambition is to allow this product to evolve through global contribution of users, creators, and, and content. Um, you know, this this differs from a lot of the like more simplified rudimentary gameplay mechanics right. that exist in blockchain gaming, where it's truly extractive base and emission base. So it's one thing to utilize NFTs and then um, emit or inflate tokens into the economy over time. But how do you create this circular ecosystem where value is contributed and created by every one of the participants, which just leads to a virtuous uh, feedback cycle in which yep. more players, more users want to join because they can experience um, the concepts that are being built by external teams, not exclusive to uh, what we're building at Star Atlas uh, Studios. Yeah, I think, well, that in itself, I think, does really kind of separate Star Atlas when we've looked at and analyzed the, just the token projects in general, and then you get into the meta game or the metaverse games and the projects and the people that we've talked to, you know, the continuation and the narrative that we continue to look at is kind of really, there's going to be layers of blockchain development. There's going to be more advanced gameplay. There's going to be what you're talking about, AAA level studio quality games. And then kind of this next evolution of both play to earn and play and earn, because that's one of the arguments that many people make around just blockchain gaming in general is this, it can't fall back to just a, a play to earn, you know, economy, because uh, you're kind of forcing people into that kind of format versus somebody who's really going into the game to enjoy themselves and have, you know, a complete new experience. And, oh, by the way, there might be some earning opportunities in there as well. So I think that is going to be a big separator of games that really make it in the future. On that point, let's talk about your NFT marketplace and kind of how will that work? How successful has it been? Kind of what the role of the NFT side is going to play in Star, in Star Atlas? The, the Star Atlas marketplace was one of the um, first products that we actually brought to market. Um, so we announced and debuted to the public just in January of this year as a as a concept. So that that included the release of our uh, white paper with all of the gameplay mechanics and gameplay pillars, uh, as well as an announcement around an initial uh, initial uh, kind of seed round funding through token sales. And um, you know, starting in January, we we were already recruiting new engineers and new talent to the team, um, and then as early as April, we launched uh, really the most robust and one of the first. Uh, NFT marketplaces on the Solana ecosystem. So our marketplace is is built entirely on chain. Uh, you know, as I mentioned, we are we're building on the Solana blockchain for a number of reasons, um, and uh, we were able to leverage Project Serum. So the Serum decentralized exchange tech, open source code. We pulled that in, and our entire marketplace is built directly on on Project Serum. So uh, when we list a new asset, for example, it get it gets listed on the decentralized exchange and then becomes immediately available for purchase from uh, anyone operating within that that ecosystem. What's uh, I think really promising about building on Serum is is this concept of the central limit order book that was introduced by the team behind Serum. Uh, mm -hmm. This differs from the way that most decentralized finance applications work, wherein you essentially have a single pool of liquidity that exists on uh, on any one of those DeFi platforms. Uh, across Solana and the Serum ecosystem, any user interface can actually tap into the, the same unified uh, liquidity pool. And so we've actually seen a, a quite a bit of innovation go on uh, and arise around the Star Atlas project with people that are building their own UI, tapping into that same liquidity pool and tapping into that same decentralized exchange. So we launched, uh, we launched this marketplace in, uh, in April of this year, and our first NFTs to come to market were part of a campaign that we called Rebirth, Genesis of a Metaverse. And these were uh, digital collectibles, uh, what we call multimedia meta posters. So art created in-house, enhanced with augmented reality. And then we partnered with some mainstream musicians like Blondish and Bass Jackers and Deadmau5 to produce audio soundscapes that underlie those posters. And what the user is able to experience is, is uh, kind of the first sense of immersion into the metaverse, uh, right. scanning a QR code, viewing their poster, comes to life in 3D, and then audio plays behind it. 
Couple of couple of questions here. I mean, obviously you've seen we showed a, a few of the marketplace assets on screen there. But is there any direction that you guys are seeing that are maybe what to collect first from an NFT standpoint? So in April, uh, excuse me, in uh, September of this year, we we went to market with what we call the Galactic Asset Offering. Uh, so these are uh, the first assets that we sold that will be usable in game, and these are ships. Now we right. have a wide range of, of ships that are going to be available for play. Uh, currently scoped out over 140 ships, and we've released. Uh, something like 21 of those ships to date. And they all have uh, different uh, size classes, um, uh, categorization of, of what their intended use is. So things like freighters versus fighters, stealth, bounty hunters, um, uh, racers. We have all kinds of uh, different ships that are available. So, I, you know, it's hard to recommend um, any, make any broad recommendation as to which one to purchase. It, it really depends on what the, uh, the gamer's gameplay style, intended gameplay style is. So if you want to be mining uh, and extracting ore from a planet somewhere and hauling that across the universe, then, you know, owning a freighter would probably be most suitable for them. But if you, if you want to go out and engage in PvP or player versus player combat, then having a fighter uh, would be relevant. But really what we're seeing are massive guilds forming. Now, mm -hmm. in the Star Atlas nomenclature, we call these decentralized autonomous corporations, and they're operating right now as real corporations. They're out there minting their own NFTs, issuing their own digital currencies, raising capital, and then utilizing that capital to purchase fleets of assets from us with the intention of deploying that and operating across the Star Atlas universe. Yeah, we've been actually have been in contact with a few of these that uh, I've been amazed at, at kind of this ecosystem that's already starting to develop around Star Atlas for sure. When you, okay, so you look at the ecosystem, you look at kind of how you guys have reformatted what NFTs really are about. Uh, talk about the meta posters again, because I thought this was really something you glossed over on, and I feel like this is a huge variation in NFTs that really could kind of leverage up where the NFT market is going. How did meta, meta posters come about? Kind of what's the future of that? Any secret or hidden potential agenda down the road? Well, it was a it was a really fun campaign. So it, uh, Rebirth ran from uh, uh, the end of April through the end of July, and uh, we had a couple of motivations there. Obviously, generating revenue was one of those. Uh, but through this fourteen poster, fourteen week campaign, uh, what we executed on was revealing lore and background and story behind Star Atlas. So once again, thinking about very high quality images that we produce in house, um, and then the augmented reality and audio soundscapes behind them. Uh, the idea was, okay, let's introduce people to the story, how we got to where we are in the Star Atlas universe, which is really an extension of our, of our physical reality as it exists today, um, at least in the, in the plot and story of, of Star Atlas. But uh, over uh, each one of these weeks, as we reveal a new poster, uh, the user gets to expand their uh, knowledge and awareness of, of that lore of the game. And so uh, it, it enabled us to generate a, a pretty considerable amount of revenue, especially early on. It was, uh, you know, in the six and a half million dollar range over the, the 14 week period. Um, you know, obviously this revenue is being 100% uh, reinvested back into the growth and development of the company because we have a very ambitious uh, vision ahead of us that, and, a, and a very long development roadmap. But um, so it, it also allowed us to continuously grow and expand on our community over those 14 weeks because there's a lot of social media sharing. And it's one of the reasons why we uh, wanted to create this, this immersive experience is because people were super excited about seeing these. And uh, while we believe more in the potential of utility-driven assets in the long term, uh, I, I absolutely appreciate the uh, art and cultural value of collectability as well. So. Those were, you know, just just some of the uh, motivations behind uh, behind the campaign. But on top of that, we also had a, a pretty great economic structure with incentives and bonuses that were baked in. So for users right. that were purchasing the posters and collecting through this series, um, uh, reaching various tiers or milestones of of the collection, they were also rewarded with in-game assets. Now we executed on that through a, a snapshot, a blockchain snapshot. So kind of capturing uh, a state of the blockchain at a fixed point in time. And then based on that snapshot data, we delivered 
things like ships and skins, custom emotes, uh, land and land claims, and then buildings and structures and mining equipment that would live on that. So the value that we delivered significantly outweighed kind of the cost of the posters initially and it was one of the ways that we were able to reward those early supporters that were purchasing these collectibles from us yeah i i thought it was you know it seems to be you know kind of this next level for the nft side of things because we are seeing a lot more innovation in how nfts are being constructed especially with utility aspects around nfts explain how you see the utility future with that nfts within the star atlas ecosystem and gaming opportunities so the primary asset classes that exist across Star Atlas include the ships. Um, now these ships uh, are going are fully 3D modeled, you know, interactive fleets that people can pilot and staff with crew members. So it's right. it's your ships, it's your crew members, it's components uh, um, and modifications that you can make to your ships, so weaponry and shields and thrusters, things like this. These are all NFTs, um, and then also land. So virtual real estate can be purchased buildings and structures that exist on that land, so farming equipment, mining equipment. Um, the farming and mining equipment all go into one of our dedicated gameplay loops, which is essentially a, a crafting system. So extracting ore from the planet enables um, uh, kind of the introduction of these materials into the supply chain. And through the refinement of the materials and aggregation of them, players are able to create and mint their own NFTs based on blueprints that, that will be released over time. And so uh, we have guilds that are dedicated to nothing but mining operations because they want to be mass manufacturers of NFTs in the future. Um, and then, uh, you know, so beyond the land and, and building, there's also more, uh, call it social, uh, social real estate usage. And so these are player habitats that will exist on uh, space stations. And while the habitats are not productive in nature, it provides an environment, a, a virtual environment uh, for people to socialize, hang out with their friends, put their collectibles on display, um, and otherwise just spend time with other people and, and hang out in, uh, in space. I like it. I think you know, that's what we're going to see, I think, a lot of in, ter in terms of how utility tokens, or excuse me, utility NFTs, Will, will really kind of expand the kind of the game functionality into the next level. I'm curious as to seeing, will those start to take uh, kind of a life of their own and create these economies, much like what you guys have had happen within the Star Atlas ecosystem of people starting to build upon, upon that and kind of grow from there. When you look at, I want to jump over to gameplay types and a little bit around kind of the grand strategy, exploration, the RPG game, space flight, simulation, et cetera. Which route are you guys going to take in terms of first release? So we're, we're developing on two concurrent tracks. Um, we are releasing this concept of a mini game, which is an in-browser web app. Um, mm -hmm. And concurrently, we're developing out the hyper-realistic, fully immersive world in Unreal Engine 5. Now, Unreal Engine 5 development is going to take considerably longer than it will for us to develop out more of the rudimentary gameplay mechanics that we can deliver in browser. So the first mm -hmm. releases that, that users will see, and actually we have a release that's targeted uh, to, to uh, come out on December 16th, so just in mm -hmm. uh, eight days yep. now. Uh, is, is what we call SCORE. This is ship commissions on remote expeditions. And effectively what it is, is the ability to take your NFTs, enlist those in the faction, in one of the three factions that you will have joined as a player across the Star Atlas universe, and, um, and manage resources associated with those ships. So food, fuel, ammunition, and then making sure that your ship is repaired. Um, once again, this is kind of one of the unique aspects of the way that we're developing the Star Atlas economy is that we we treat it uh, very much like real world business operations. So while players are able to earn with any of the assets that they own, uh, there is a responsibility on them and kind of a burden on them to manage the efficiency of their operations, uh, wherein a portion of that revenue needs to be reinvested back into maintaining various assets. So if you're a pilot of a ship, that means you have to refuel it over time. If you take damage, you have to repair that. You have to feed your crew as you progress through space. And, and likewise, on land, you're paying land value tax just to own the land, uh, which is kind of a, a, a recurring, consistent expense for the landowner, uh, as well as replacing and repairing mining equipment. If your mining drill wears out and you want to continue extracting ore, you have to purchase uh, a, a new mining drill. And, and so 
All of these expenses, though, actually get recaptured by the metaverse economy itself, and those flow directly into our Star Atlas DAO. So without getting too deep into that side of things, the, the Star Atlas DAO is essentially what is going to enable full decentralized governance um, and decision making around the future design, development and evolution of Star Atlas over time. And so the part of the reward mechanism for them is that all of the economic operating costs that exist uh, throughout the entire GDP of Star Atlas economy flows directly into that into that DAO, and they get to determine those governors and stakeholders get to determine what to uh, what to do with those proceeds. I think first of all, I think of the DAO, uh, you know, role in a lot of where some of these ecosystems will go in the future, because I think that is truly going to be the future of how, especially in when you think about blockchain gaming and what that means to community driven projects like what you guys are trying to build. Uh, it's going to be even more and more evident that that's going to be the route to take. I want to jump into Solana. Obviously, you guys are, are building within the Solana ecosystem. Your thoughts of what the advantages are there with that and uh, kind of where that future might go in maybe the next, say, 18 months. We were quite an early adopter to Solana. Um, you know, this was part of the early conceptualization phase of Star Atlas in mid 2020, analyzing what, uh, you know, we, we consider to be generation three layer one protocols. So kind of the mm -hmm. emerging uh, layer ones that were that were coming out at the time. And, you know, really the the, the most critical aspect of selecting a, a protocol to build on was, you know, what is the scalability of this network? We're looking right. at Star Atlas in terms of not hundreds of thousands or even millions of users, but as we emerge into the metaverse space and create this open economy, potentially billions of users from around the world will be will be using our platform. And so we need underlying tech, a platform that we're building on that is capable of scaling uh, to those levels. And, and while Solana might not be there yet, we believe that it is probably the only network that is going to be capable of that going into the future. And so that includes things like very high transaction throughput greater than 65,000 transactions per second, um, currently uh, capable on, on Solana, uh, um, uh, low transaction costs, uh, less than one penny per transaction on Solana. And then really one of the other critical aspects for us was uh, this low latency. So sub-second finality right. on state changes on the network. That's very, very important if you're a gamer um, and any of the gamers out there that are listening will, will uh, fully appreciate that one of the things that's most frustrating when you're playing a video game is if you're experiencing lag, right? Uh, it will get you killed and it just reduces the quality of the gameplay experience overall. So again, from a tech standpoint, we really saw Solana as being superior, um, but also we saw a major opportunity to have a symbiotic relationship with them through the early selection of that platform. At the time when we uh, kind of finalized our relationship, this was August or September of 2020, there were only maybe uh, 20 projects, 20 or 25 projects that were actually building on the network at the time. Uh, they saw massive potential in us to bring a huge user base uh, into the Solana ecosystem. And we also saw um, the potential for them to, you know, cross promote and support and leverage uh, the existing community that, that they had. Um, and we did see that materialize. They were, they were very helpful in promoting us uh, to their community early on. This bootstrapped the growth of our community and it's really only grown exponentially from there. And then one final point that I would kind of add on this is that we do have a major emphasis of integrating DeFi components into Star Atlas. And one of the major emphases of development across Solana is the, you know, the DeFi ecosystem. And so we're able to benefit from all of the innovation from all of these teams all over the world um, in, in developing um, protocols uh, and, and code that we can essentially directly integrate because we're all on the same protocol. Uh, so this would include things like insurance policies that you might want to purchase an insurance policy on your ship uh, in case it gets destroyed in space. Um, things like decentralized lending which uh, we saw this uh, really come to fruition through Yield Guild games on right. Axie Infinity, which is one of the earliest blockchain games, uh, but through their scholarship model, wherein not everybody can purchase some of these assets, you know, because of, uh, you know, financial uh, access, but they can borrow one of these assets, utilize it in game. And the trade-off for them is that they're, you know, they're spending time to be an operator, they earn income, and then that income gets shared with the owner of the asset. And so, um, you know, this, these, are, these types of tools are currently coming to Solana now, and we're very much looking forward to providing yeah. that tool set to the user base. You know, Michael, we've, we've watched, uh, you know, projects like Axie, if you look at Alluvium, which are somewhat, 
I won't say based on, but in, in some way anchored to what's happening with Ethereum and just high gas fees, kind of the evolution where ETH 2.0 is going to go for ecosystems that are building in that. Obviously, Solana is a completely different, you know, uh, animal in itself. I was surprised to hear you say that, you know, in terms of scalability, you feel like that might be the only, one of the only blockchains in this layer one, uh, kind of these Gen 3 uh, blockchains that are really going to be able to handle that kind of, of behemoth of user base and the transactions, all that kind of thing. Do you feel like you'll see more projects start to move into these other layer one um, chains to kind of avoid this? Or do you feel like ETH eventually is going to kind of make its way through the system and eventually be able to handle the kind of scalability issues that it's facing right now? I would say it's questionable. Obviously, the discussion around uh, moving Ethereum to proof of stake um, and also, you know, ETH 2.0, which should in, in improve the efficiency of the network, lower costs, uh, create higher right. transaction throughput. You know, I'm sure that those are areas that they're working on, although those have been, you know, this proposal for ETH 2.0 has been around for years now. We've yeah. seen it, when it came came to kind of came to market. So, um what the advantage that Ethereum has is first mover, right? So yep. they, uh, EVM was the first smart contract platform to exist, launched mm -hmm. in, I want to say 2014 or 2015. And um, and so now there's a, a tremendous amount of innovation that's going on there. But uh, we're, we're very quickly seeing different layer one protocols take market share from Ethereum. And, yeah. um, you know, the the tech where it stands today is is superior on, at least for these applications, is superior on other chains. And and um, with that being said, though, we, you know, we are still very, very early across all of the ecosystem and across blockchain adoption in general. So while Ethereum had a great first mover advantage, I'm kind of curious to see where these many new millions of new users that are going to be entering crypto, what will be their first experience on blockchain? Yeah. And to, to my exact point earlier on, uh, we see the potential to on-ramp millions to billions of users and we'll be bringing them onto Solana because that's where we're building, right? Yeah, well, and I think your, your point to that is scalability is going to come much faster. Back to my point that I made in the beginning of the show is that we've been surprised at the scale and growth of the segment uh, as aggressive as it has grown, especially here in 2021, where we're seeing just absolutely no stopping, if anything, just an acceleration. We may be on the very edge of just seeing where that bell curve will grow. So I think you're right to your point is scalability, on-ramp, ease of use, and the ability to go mainstream is going to be very critical with any games that really start to go global uh, in, in this era. Talk to me about the token architecture with Atlas and Polis and how those will be utilized in the game. Kind of give me a rundown of what what the functionality is going to look like within Star Atlas for the token architecture. Yeah, we, we operate a, a dual token ecosystem, as we say. Atlas is uh, uh, the in-game currency. And I say in-game currency somewhat loosely. Uh, again, referencing back to what the metaverse will ultimately become, these are effectively nation states. Um, especially when executed on chain and through decentralized uh, ecosystem. So uh, within the Star Atlas universe, uh, the uh, Atlas is the is the currency for which all income and expenses are denominated. So if you're operating a ship and you complete a mission, you earn rewards in Atlas. But as I said earlier, you also have to pay for things like repair and food and and fuel for your ship over time with Atlas. Um, uh, so with that said, Atlas is the primary reward mechanism across Star Atlas, and it's it's not only used in-game, but it's also used for things like purchasing uh, ships from us on our NFT marketplace. Polis, uh, in contrast, is our decentralized autonomous organization, or DAO token, uh, and what that will permit is owners who, who hold Polis, stake it, they become governors of the network. Uh, they are able to introduce proposals and the community is able to vote on proposals in terms of what the future design and development of Star Atlas looks like in general. And that includes uh, decision making around economics. So what are inflation rates or release schedules inside Star Atlas? Uh, while we have those predetermined and scoped out in our uh, game economic white paper, uh, those uh, uh, the decisions uh, of the community will directly impact how that gets effectuated in the future. Um, but they also can decide on, decide on things like which gameplay features do they want to see next. 
Um, uh, what, what are the asset release schedules? What is the general growth and in inflation or expansion of the universe itself? And then really going uh, deeper into, uh, into the future, there is the potential for the, the governors uh, over time as, as we emit more tokens. Um, I, I kind of want to place a caveat here and say uh, for the next three to five years, we have majority control over the DAO. That was intentional. That's so that we can fulfill our obligations to develop and, and release this vision that we've laid out. But over time, they could, it would be possible for the DAO to essentially employ, recruit and employ other game developers and studios to create content associated with Star Atlas. And so what that leads to and, and why I referred to uh, our metaverse as something that can live on in perpetuity, uh, not just 10 years or 20 years, but really hundreds, <laughs> hundreds of years or thousands of years, is that uh, with or without us, you know, assuming that there, there is stewardship of the metaverse through the DAO, uh, new innovators and entrepreneurs can bring content and continue to build upon what Star Atlas is. So it's not essential that we're here in the long term because the product can continue to evolve. Yeah, for sure. And I think those kind of lofty goals are going to be very critical to kind of uh, when you look at the overall gaming aspect of what the global community looks like today in terms of total number of players, the market size of where gaming is today. I think it was this recent report around 350 billion and people now pointing that that could double in the next five to seven years. So closing in on what could be in this decade, a trillion dollar market for where, especially when, with the introduction of blockchain and the acceleration of blockchain gaming. My question is between Web 2.0 and Web 3.0 development that we are, we are seeing kind of just birth right here in front of us right now. Do you see that those two, you know, those two environments are eventually going to merge into one unification of how gaming in general will be looked at in the future? Or do you think we'll continue to see kind of two completely different arenas around blockchain and what we see now in traditional Web 2.0? Oh, I think Web 3.0 is definitely the future, and and Web 3 is really uh, designed by you know decentralized, distributed networks that are effectively owned and incentivized by the people that are operating within them. Um, I think the metaverse is actually the next evolution of Web 3.0, and now they're yeah. you know they're actually being developed in parallel. And kind of going back to your point on the potential economy of gaming, while that might become a trillion dollar economy. The potential of the metaverse itself is a multi-trillion dollar economy. It is sure. absolutely enormous because we're not only talking about gaming. As I said, gaming is one of the applications that we're building within the Star Atlas metaverse. It is our flagship product and, and it's going to be entertaining, engaging, exciting. It's going to attract millions of, or billions of users. But the metaverse itself introduces all different types of aspects of interaction with the platform. So. Right. Um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, <laughs> for whatever people want to say about him, you know, I think he, out and this is not an endorsement of, you know, their product meta, but, you know, I think he outlines quite well what the social potential is for operating for inside sure. these fully virtual worlds. So whether that's working in space, hanging out with friends, um, learning, right, education, academies, universities, Big time. virtual learning inside, uh, inside metaverse will exist. And then one of the areas that I think will be most disrupted is commerce. Uh, e-commerce, you know, once when you have the opportunity to enter into a fully immersive world, shop inside one of these locations um, in Star Atlas and uh, the goods that you purchase could be delivered to your physical residence. That is a superior shopping experience to simply, you know, going on Amazon.com or going on Zappos or whatever your favorite e-commerce site of choice is uh, to purchase products. You actually have the potential to interact with them either in AR or VR and there's another emerging technology that is haptic suits, which is, you know, physical feedback mechanism for items that you touch. Uh, <laughs> as all of these things evolve and grow over time, I, again, I, I believe that that virtual shopping experience, 3D shopping experiences, is going to completely disrupt e-commerce. So there's many, many segments and industries that are just going to have to evolve in some way. And I think Web 2.0 eventually will die. Uh, Web 3 is the future and, and the metaverse is essentially the future of the web in general. It's so good to hear you say that because I am old school Web 2.0 and I feel like it needs its funeral. It needs to, it needs to move on to the next generation of what's going to happen in technology, yeah. especially around what you're talking about. Because I think you are right in the sense that we've, we, you know, we've been obviously studying this for quite some time. But the point is, is there's just so much early innovation 
occurring and back to what could be multi-trillion dollar economies starting to really develop and change kind of the dynamic of maybe how the entire globe thinks about everything from working, playing, and all things in terms of a digital ecosphere that will be developed out there over the next few years, over the next few decades, really. So I think that's going to be a big one. Uh, Michael Wagner, it's been great uh, having you on the show today. Thank you so much for stopping in. Great to hear all that you guys are, are doing over at Star Ask. Can't wait for this, uh, this drop that you guys have coming soon. It's going to be fun to watch. Yeah. Great, Paul. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate the conversation. You bet. All right. So you guys are tuned in over here on the podcast right now. Make sure and jump over here to the YouTube channel. This is the place to catch interviews like this, but also the analysis, a lot of the technical side of things when we look at the crypto market and also blockchain in general. Also, don't forget to join the Diamond Circle. It's very simple. It's where all of our analysis drop in. We do a bunch of NFTs and also digital asset giveaways. We've got some big stuff coming your way as well in the Diamond Circle, so it's easy to join and it's free for you guys to jump in. And of course, if you have a topic or maybe a game or a metaverse project that you want us to take a look at, hit us in the comments below, or you can of course hit me up on Twitter. It's at Paul Barron. Make sure and follow me there. We'll catch you next time right here on TechBath.